things. Because we, I was doing finals and I'd just sort of gone out for the night and it's like, I've got to go the following day. I think you rang up and you sort of you didn't tell me, cancelled work, rang in sick to work, then came back and came to me and said, I've just rung in sick to work. And I said, I can't, I've got an essay to write. I can't stay. I've got to go back, go, go back to my flat and start writing. This, I've got a deadline for like Friday or something, whatever it was. Or, you know, I've got two more days to go or something like that. Um, so I think you were a bit upset. And then mm. it sort of went, mm. so they went, it went several weeks. Several weeks went by. <laughs> and I kept seeing his flatmate in the pub sending messages back saying, it was, you know, where is Richard? Sorry. <laughs> So, I think, I think you must have, I mean, I think you must have come down and... Well, it was our local, there were two pubs right. in, in the neighbourhood. You mean really? you didn't come down looking for me? No. <laughs> it's nice to know 25 <laughs> years later, isn't it, <laughs> that all of my messages were just ignored. <laughs> I was very naive. I was very naive at the time. How much harder did I have to work? The messages were the messages did get to me. They did get they to me. They did get you to just me. ignored. Them. I was told it was a really good thing that somebody was asking after you. You ought to pay attention. Mm -hmm. yeah. So have your lives changed since being together? Um oh god yes. Um but we're, you know, the, it, we've been together for 25 years. So your life's going to change a lot. Life is going to change a lot anyway. Yeah. Um, I, when I left Sussex, I, I went to Sussex to do a music degree because I was teaching music peripatetically in schools and couldn't, uh, didn't get holiday pay or sick pay or whatever no pension, nothing. It's, you just got paid by the hour that you do. Um, and I and I got to 33 and thought, this is, th you know, this isn't, this is not doable for the future. This is just, uh, just you know, it's not economically viable. Um, so I went to do a music degree in order to get a job in schools teaching music. The music department wasn't very good. Uh, and I had met all of these people, these people in Gay Sock who were doing politics and sociology and all of these um, in more interesting things, talking about revolution, and it was the 80s, and the helicopters were flying overhead, and it was fairly, um, it was really, really, you know, it was uh, an interesting place to be. So, um, and I, we, I had a, the, there were key courses that we were encouraged by our peers to go, to join, and one of them was called Modern European Mind, which was with a woman called Gillian Rose, which, you, well, the different people taught it, but it, one of the best people to take it was, was somebody called Gillian Rose. Her thing was, as I say, was, was that they, was, was about legality. And that uh, prompted me then to think when I left about what to do. And I didn't think that being a lawyer was viable because I was then 36 when I was leaving. So to do another training, to start a whole professional training over again, although people do, um, but I didn't go down that route. So, but I had, before I become a musician, when I first came to London, I'd got two thirds of my surveying qualification done. So I thought the simplest way was to become, was to re, because there's a lot of law in, in not in, this is um, not like being an estate agent. If you're a, a, a proper surveyor, then there is a, a lot of, some of a lot, quite a lot of law involved in the, whether it's between landlord and tenant, so it's oppositional again, so the conflict stuff and how it's resolved, that's all. So there's a lot of stuff that actually uh, I, I, I could, I, my Sussex education really helped in sort of setting a context, really. Mm. Um, and Richard, you were advised by Max about your career, weren't you? Yeah. Well, for me, um, having got an because um, when we first met, we were living in, in both in, on separate estates in, in, in upper floors of tower blocks. When we met in this place down in Hackney, but after a few months, we moved, I moved into uh, Max's flat, 
and but and and for me being uh, from my background, which was which is also uh, was also a working work, working class grammar school boy, it was always about you know. Once, once, um, once studying was over, you had to get a job, and then you had to stay in the job, and it was all, it was all kind of taking risks was not really, was not, was not really the thing, you know. It, it, um, but being in a relationship, um, particularly with you, and then it allowed us to start taking risks. So one of the things I was able to do was while staying in work, uh, we gambled on me taking a drop in salary to become a trainee. To start my account, to start my accountancy um, training, something I would never, never have dared do um, uh, on my own. Um, so we did that, and that's paid. Yeah. That paid off. So we did. I well, remember a friend of mine coming around, <laughs> who was had been a Trotskyist, and we were in a relationship, and it was sort of fake. As we, as you know, I mean, as gay relationships are fluid. So as I met Richard, and this relationship was sort of. Becoming less focused upon, um, but Nigel came around oh. and he said, "And you had got oh. paid by cash the this first is, month." When I first when I first, when I first met you, we, um, I was work, I was having a really hard time working for this little private firm in uh, in Camden, and had been told basically, you know, if the boss finds out you're gay. You'll, you you will get sacked. There's no two ways about it. So yeah, I absolutely had to be up quiet. And I and I had my first boyfriend at the time, so I was you know all doughy eyed and wanting to write his name on my on my pad and all this kind of stuff. So it was actually it was really um, really challenging. Anyway, after after that, um, I'd met i met Max and, we, and and I helped you write the application. And you helped me write the application form for a job at Islington. And the job I got at Islington was as a gay at, man. man. <laughs> yeah, it was all very early eighties. Uh, uh, but I got I got a job at Islington Council, which was you know it was it was in the, in the, the Sun newspaper described it as the Pufter's Paradise because of their equal opportunities policies, and there's a you know um, and oh. The mayor was gay, and his his partner was the mayor, uh, the mayor's consort or whatever. Just completely different, really good. But the first my first month's wages from Islington I got in cash. Because they hadn't set the bank. So I had a big wad of fivers. And Nigel had come to visit. <laughs> and I came into the flat. Waving. Up on the 12th floor, waving, waving all these fivers, and Nigel was there. Was really Nigel quite embarrassed. turned to me and he said, mm. I can see the economic base of this relationship. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then, we, and then I would do on a similar sort of line, when, um, because that was an admin job, and after you'd done that but admin job for training. a little while, yeah. while then you, we had a conversation about what it would be that we, we should do, because I was starting yeah. to think, because um, I had taken an admin job when I first left Sussex, and I got to start thinking about what I was oh. going to do seriously. Oh, it's worth, it's worth mentioning that, although you are 10 years older than me, because of the breakup of the previous relationship and then being a student, uh, you had... A, a mattress. Oh God! I had a mattress, mattress a tumble dryer, and a tumble dryer. That was it. That was all your worldly goods, wasn't it? Absolutely. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so we sat <laughs> on the we sat on about the mattress. No sugar daddy. We sat on yeah. the mattress on the floor uh, because we, there was not. It was not even a bed. It was a mattress on the floor in the living room, looking over the Hackney rooftops, looking over. King. What shall we do? <laughs> How are we going to get out of here? What is it we're going to do? And you and uh, and you turned to me and said, "I do remember it uh, clearly." You said, "Shall I do the same as you?" And I said, "Certainly not. You're going to do a proper job. There are two choices: either the law or accountancy." And Richard said, "Well, I dropped out of law at Nottingham." And I said, "Well." Your choice is made then, really, isn't it? We need to find you a job in accountancy. And I think, when, when, what happened? Was it Greenwich you went to? Oh, it was awful. I went to Greenwich first. It was awful. Oh, God, that was really horrible. homophobic. They were horrible. After, after 
um, working at Islington, which where you're encouraged to be yourself, you know, and, and people used to always start conversations well, as a, you know, whatever. Um, and that was all for a dreadful, horrible place. But at least it got but started it on the got train, started, and then you went back to Islington, um, doing education, uh, accountants. Yeah, yeah. And have not really looked back. Yeah. And yeah, Warden Forest is very different. And then, well, I was still working at Islington for a long time after we moved here, but we've heard about Walthamstow <laughs> from colleagues there who, who were buying flats and houses in what seemed like the suburbs compared to deep, you know, deepest shore ditch. We used to drive up here and get out of the car and walk around the streets smelling the trees because it felt like the country. Um, and we did that on s several occasions. And this was at a time when, again, it was a property crash. So we bought this house and it had been repossessed and, and squatted. wrecked, squatted and everything. It was just, we bought it for very little money. Uh, not but surprisingly, because it was it was it was almost yeah. derelict. It was, yeah. and we then threw money at it and poured money into it. But over time, because it was actually it was actually a house, and we could afford a house. We could afford a house, a, house even if it was a shack. You know, uh, at the time, that allowed us to do that. I mean, it was, there was a. I don't, do you know what an Anderson shelter is? In the war, they had shelters that they put with corrugated roofs that they put in the garden. So that when the bombs were dropping, they'd go and hide in the, in the shelter. They'd go and sit in the shelter so the house didn't get... If the house got hit, you were, at, were somewhere else. I don't know why. It doesn't make any sense to me. The, the people up in the, in the plains couldn't possibly have been able to work out whether it was a house or a shelter. And I would have thought you'd be safer off in the house than you would in the shelter. Because if the, you know, if the bomb hits the shelter, you've just got the corrugated roof on top. But if it hits the house, at least you've got... No, because then yeah. all the house falls well, on, on top, top of, of you. you. But if it hits the shelter, you're going to get it's killed anyway. Yeah, if it's direct. I don't understand yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, it's one of those sorts of things they did in the war, like collecting everybody's railings up to make bombs. We haven't got any railings here, because they took all the metal away. It was seen as a sort of social thing to do. It was a sort of ideological thing, propaganda, to get people's spirits going, you know, you're helping the war effort. So you take all the metal away, actually it's the wrong metal to make bombs. So what they did was just take them out in ships and dump them in the North Sea, because it was too expensive to return them to their owners, if they could find them, because nobody had a filing system to say whose railings were these, compared to those, so you can imagine. God, how did we win the war? <laughs> Unbelievable. And you won in foster parenting, didn't you? We were yeah. foster parenting. Yeah, did that for about five, five years. Well, I was thrown out of home when I was 17. My father was not a nice person. Um, and he... he uh, uh, Oh, I won't go into oh. detail of it, but we had a, another, yet another argument. And I was beaten up and thrown into the street uh, and just left for, you know, just... Uh, but fortunately, my neighbours took me in. And they had two friends who were teachers who uh, I went to stay with um, after that so that I had somewhere to stay because I was still at school. I was doing my, my A-levels, which were a disaster. That's how I ended up not going to university when I was 18, because my A-levels were wrecked by the stupidity of this man who professed to be my father. Um, so later, when because that had happened for me, and actually somebody looked after me when that happened, um, I don't know how we heard about it. We heard about the Albert Kennedy Trust, which was a group that it is a group, it still exists, which uh, takes care of young people who've, who are homeless, really, on the streets, have run, either run away or been thrown out by their parents and nowhere to go. And so they, have, they train up the carers and they've got social workers and mm. stuff. So as people, young people, they, there's a centre in Manchester as well as London and they've got, I think they had a, opened something in Brighton as well. So they've got places in key places. Um.